Good uh, morning, uh, everybody. In case you're following this uh, talk online, you should have a black screen now in front of your eyes. This is not a computer error. I want you to see a, a black screen. So uh, you might be unwell and you might uh, pay a visit to uh, your doctor. Martin, Martin and the... sorry to interrupt online. Go ahead. Uh, we see your uh, initial slide, not the black screen. Me, I wanted you to see a black screen. Thank you, James. A black screen you will see. James is invaluable to me. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> you a... always are. Black screen, there we go. James, have you got a black screen? All I have is a black screen now. Oh, Thank you. I'm so happy. <laughs> I will let you continue. Sorry about the interruption. Thank you, James. So you might be unwell. You might want to pay a visit to your doctor. And the first thing the doctor will ask you is, uh, where does it hurt? Please uh, explain to me your problem and how can I help? And if you are a particularly pessimistic person, you might exaggerate uh, the gravity of your health trouble and go over the top. And if you are a particularly optimistic person, then you might turn down the severity of how un unwell you are. And uh, by a game of question and answers, the doctor might have a more realistic vision onto the, the true status of your health problem. But instead of using question and answers, the doctor might have a little hammer in their bag. They might hit on your knee and uh, your leg might uh, jerk forward. And by measuring the extent of the jerking of your leg, he might assess your health status without relying on your subjective perception of how well you are. This is a reflex arc. You send a stimulus uh, to a living system. A neural pathway is exploited in the living body. A motor response uh, results, and uh, the motor response is a reflection of the status of the neural pathway that has been exploited in the experiment. Uh, such a reflex arc can be extremely profound in its assessment, even though it is very simple. One of these is the Babinski test, uh, a test uh, undertaken on newborn infants. You don't need any electronics. You don't need any instrument. You just use your finger and you stroke the sole of the foot of a newborn infant. A neural pathway is exploited in the baby's uh, central nervous system, and the motor response should be the toes spreading outwards. If they spread inwards, unfortunately, there is something fundamentally wrong in the central nervous system of this newborn infant. It's very simple, you just need your finger, there's no electronics, there's no instrument, and it is very profound in the assessment that is provided to the doctor. Such tests is undertaken hundreds of times every day on planet Earth because it's very useful. Another such uh, reflex arc is the Moro test. In this one, uh, again, on uh, newborn infants, you uh, grab them in your hands, you fake to drop them. Don't drop your baby, just fake to drop it. And uh, the motor response should be arms opening up and then clasping back in in order for the baby to grasp the, their mother, which they, they think they are losing. Uh, very simple and very powerful in the assessment of the health status that it is providing. So back in 2017, we came up with uh, an exhaustive study onto uh, a motor response of the honeybee, a vibrational pulse that it's uh, providing. We uh, named it the whooping signal. When you surprise a bee, we claimed that uh, the bee has a motor response, which provides a vibration, which sounds a whoop like this. Precisely as I've told you, bees go whoop, and we called it the whooping signal. So uh, we were excited that uh, we had a motor response uh, to uh, the fact of stimulating bees. And we started to try to demonstrate visually and with vibrations that we had such a reflex arc in the honeybee. 
So we had a specialized uh, honeybee uh, in our laboratory. These bees are free to fly in and out of our laboratory through the wall. And it also has a transparent box into which we can lift a frame and we can undertake videoing of the bees whilst we also hear the vibrations that they provide because the particular frame that we are holding up into the box is actually equipped with accelerometers. So we have video evidence of the bees and we simultaneously record the vibrational signal from the bees. In doing so, we can also surprise the bees and we can try and see that whooping signal. So uh, Andy here is about to film the bees. We're gonna lift the frame and Michael is about to use this little white rod in order to surprise the bees from the other side of the frame. And we are going to film bees that are oblivious to this signal. And let's see if we can see their reflex arc response. So uh, I'm about to play you a video. The sound that you will hear is not sound. It's originally a vibration. So there's an accelerometer in the honeycomb. It is logging the vibrations taking place on the honeycomb. And these will be conveyed to the speaker in this room and at home, wherever you are following this uh, presentation online. You're going to watch my bees move. You're gonna hear the crawling of the bees on the honeycomb. And you're gonna hear Michael thump the honeycomb once. It's gonna go thump. I'm sorry, nothing special is going to happen. He's going to thump it a second time. Thump, you will hear it. Again, I am sorry, nothing much is going to happen. But on the third thump, which is a slightly louder, you are going to see, enjoy, and hear the, uh, the bees reacting to that uh, stimulus. And Martin, I haven't got any sound. Panic, panic. James, uh, did you get any sound from wherever you are? Uh, no, we see the video very clearly, but no sound, I'm afraid. Okay, it's being looked into. Apologies about this. Shall I try again? My PA, Martin Schumann, is looking into this. Now, clickers are put. Sorry. Oh, now. Or we can organize this. Maybe we can skip. I've got the Einstein joke, but I think it's inappropriate. It's inappropriate. Can you, try, can you try again? Yeah, my clicker is kaput. Oh, my clicker works. Uh, it's still no sound. It worked just now. Okay. I've got mega assistance now. Five of us on the case. For those of you who can't see this, super exciting. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. And would you mind pumping it up a bit? Is there... um, yeah, I'll put it up. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. We hear it online too. Oh, thank you, James. Here we go. The bees that you see them, uh, you're going to hear the vibration. And you, you're not going to see Michael. He's behind the honeycomb. And Michael is going to thump the bees three times and watch the bees on the third thump. That was it, they went woo, and uh, you might have seen them also uh, react. So uh, on the basis of this experiment, in, back in 2017, we proposed that perhaps there was a future scope in this study in exploiting a reflex arc in the honeybee. So uh, Dirk de Graaf, our coordinator in the Be Good uh, Consortium, he suggested that uh, we would implement this method and we would try actually to use this as uh, uh, probing the bees, is there actually 
a point in uh, implementing this experiment on a grand scale. So in order to implement such an experiment, the first thing we had to do was to choose a suitable transmitter to uh, transmit a vibration to the bees in an automatic fashion. The first thing we came up with was this little contraption, which is uh, controlled by a microcontroller, batteries, and you have a little motor, and we managed to program the machine so it knocks the hive uh, repeatedly. Very entertaining to watch, and uh, I hope you are laughing at home because this is not the solution we decided to end up using because you can't control the strength of the knock. Uh, it was inappropriate. The second thing we looked into was the taptic engine of iPhones, a very, very powerful miniature engine provided to uh, allowing you to provide a knock in your mobile phone. We found that the power of the knock that was delivered was insufficient. We also tried an unbalanced uh, electric motor. This is in cheaper phones in order to provide a very strong vibration in your phone. We found that this guy uh, works very well, but you can't adjust the frequency of the vibration that it provides. We found this gigantic knocker, an electromagnetic coil with a huge stainless steel rod. This supplies a powerful knock, comfortably mimicking that you would supply with your hand. The bees react big time but you need a huge electrical power to, uh, to, to uh, energize one of these guys. So we ended up using this that Dirk has already told us about this morning, an electromagnetic shaker that you can buy for 10 euros on Amazon. And uh, we decided to uh, stimulate it with uh, an oscillation in order to get a decent enough knock supplied to the bees. This is the pulse we decided to use. Well, we didn't decide, we actually experimented different uh, pulses. And this one just about provided a little reaction from the bees. Uh, you're gonna now hear the stimulus that we actually driving to stimulate the bees. Here we go. And once more, and I can't hear, oh yeah, here we go. It sounds like a submarine. Uh, you are now in a submarine with me. Let's play it once more. There we go, whoop. So it's a 0 0.1 seconds long stimulus. And in order to do it outdoors, we had the electromagnetic shakers, which were protected in uh, little lunch boxes, carefully glued by Adam in order to prevent the weather from damaging them. So we have the electromagnetic shaker sending a pulse and inside the colony, these are colonies at Ghent in Dirk de Graaf's uh, laboratory. And inside the colony, we have an accelerometer. You can just about see the cable coming out. So we have the transmission. We excite the bees. The neural pathway of the bees is explore, explored. They respond with a, a motor, neuro, motor activity and we collect the response with the accelerometer and we look into the response of the bees. Here is uh, what the response results in, in the busy summer season when the bees are very, very active. I'm going to play you a sequence of a few experiments. In reality, they are spread apart by one hour, but I don't want you to wait one hour to appreciate what's happening, so I have stacked them together. You're about to hear a, a collection of a few uh, instances of this experiment, and they are all undertaken in the summer. You're going to hear a second of vibrational measurement. You're going to hear the stimulus. And you're going to hear the responses of the bees after the stimulus. What you will hear is recorded from within the colony with an accelerometer. I hope you're very, very disappointed, bored to death, because actually nothing happens at all. So in the summertime, in the busy season, there is no measurable bees reaction. It doesn't mean to say there's no reaction, but none that I can measure. So uh, this is for the summer, and uh, you're probably starting to switch off from my talk now, but come back, please, come back, because here's what's happening in the winter time. So here's a collection of measurements in the winter. <laughs> So
So in the winter time, there is a reaction that you can hear and that you can see visu visually. There is a clear, measurable response in the winter time. Here is a collection of uh, hundreds and hundreds of stimulation. On the top of the graph, from zero to one, you have one second of uh, buzzing of the bees before the stimulus. At one second, the horizontal red line is the stimulus, and I have clipped it. It's very uh, clipped. I'm sorry about this, but we don't care. It's just the artificial stimulus. And after one, from one until three, you have uh, two seconds of data coming from the bees after the stimulus. And uh, this is unbelievably exciting. We see the summertime when there is no reaction after the pulse, but you see occasional instances as we move into the winter where the response is uh, strong and you see a pattern. There is no random uh, strong response. The, the response comes on and off with some kind of pattern. So that was very exciting. The other exciting was that the response is sometimes strong, sometimes weak. It means to say we are probing something that is changing in the neural pathway that we are exploring in the colony. And the third exciting thing that you can see is immediately after the pulse, for quarter of a second afterwards, there is a deep blue color which demonstrates a lack of signal, a decrease of buzzing signal immediately after the pulse. So the first thing we looked into was the decrease of signal a quarter of a second after the pulse. And the first idea we had was that perhaps the decrease of signal was coming from the bees that were being immobilized by the pulse that we were providing. So bees uh, can be immobilized by uh, vibrations. In fact, bees can be immobilized by vibrations coming from within themselves. Here is a short video showing a queen tooting in the center of the screen. I'm about to show you a virgin queen who is about to toot on the honeycomb. Please ignore her and please focus on the worker bees that are surrounding the queen bee. Watch carefully the worker bees. He's going to do it a second time. So I hope you have uh, managed to appreciate that upon tooting, upon sending that vibrations, the honeybees surrounding uh, the queen are actually immobile. Martin Lindauer, a PhD student of uh, Carl von Frisch, suggested that bees are immobilized by the vibrations in order to enhance the communication of the queen to the worker bees. So that's one suggestion that has been put forward to explain the immobilization of the bees with vibration. I don't know if that is the case, but you certainly will see your bees being immobilized by virgin queens tooting. So the question is, is our super short pulse that goes like a submarine, poop, does that immobilize our bees? So uh, we proceeded to try and demonstrate it with uh, an electromagnetic shaker placed on that frame, which is in that observation hive you've already seen before. The observation hive has two accelerometers. We sent this very short pulse into the frame. We videoed the bees and we tried to assess whether this super short pulse is or isn't immobilizing our bees. So here's the experiment. You can see our bees on the honeycomb and you should be able to hear the pulse that I'm sending. And if you watch carefully, you might, might not see the bees being immobilized for a tenth of a second. We were excited. We thought this is maybe working. So we decided to try to quantitate the mobility of the bees. So we proceeded to do the difference between two consecutive images of that video. If the bees are immobile, if they don't move at all, then two successive images will be identical and the subtraction will provide a zero. Whilst if the bees are mobile, two successive images will be different. The bees will have moved from one pixel to another. 
and then the difference will not be zero. So here is the processing of the, the video. The video is now on the left. On the right, you can see the difference image of between two consecutive images. And uh, watch on the bottom graph, you want to watch the green curve. The green curve is the average of this um, difference image. So each time the green curve goes down, it means to say that uh, the bees have been immobilized. And the, how deep the green curve goes down is how much we have managed to immobilize the bees. And so we were very excited to see that uh, we had quantitative ability to uh, demonstrate the immobilization of the bees with the pulse that we were driving. We also changed the frequency to observe the optimum immobilization that we can achieve. So the good news is that uh, we can demonstrate the immobilization phenomenon. The other good news is that the immobilization is maximized immediately after the application of the pulse, allowing us to have a superb assessment of the mobility of the bees. We also recorded the exponential recovery of the mobility of the bees. It's got a time constant of one second. And uh, by uh, measuring how deep the, uh, uh, the immobilization is compared with before, so the difference after and before is providing us with uh, a measurement of the mobility of the bees. The frequency analysis reveals that uh, the immobilization is maximized around 500 hertz or so, which happens to match the frequency of the tooting queen, uh, by the way. Now, what about the positive response? I've discussed the negative response, which we've demonstrated to come from the immobilization of the bees. What about the positive response, the red trace, the bees that are reacting with the application of the pulse? So we looked into uh, how repeatable is this uh, positive response. We looked into the features that are common into this positive response. To do that, we selected all the positive responses. We uh, removed the signal before, we removed the stimulus, and we just looked at the collection of honeybee responses after the pulse. So here they are, and I have ranked them from the strongest one to the weakest one. So here is a very, very large collection of bee responses from which I have removed the stimulus and I've removed the signal before the stimulus. And then I do some principal component analysis on this. I do a little bit of machine learning for the computer to tell me what are common features in these responses and what are features that are less common. So the most common feature in these curves is the PC component number one and the PC component number two. Uh, zero here is the time immediately after the stimulus. Here are uh, four seconds of data after the stimulus. And the orange curve and the blue curve are the uh, generic B response that has been established by the principal component analysis. They are very uh, smooth curves with uh, very few irregularities, and these are going to be very helpful for us to assess the colony's overall response. And in the, in the greater details of the machine learning analysis, so in principal components three, four, five, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and you could keep going like this. In them, you do see a little bit of the slow response, but you mostly see the very rapid artifacts which are coming from whooping signals. So these are whooping signals taking place at randomized times after the pulse. So the good news is that a very simple machine learning has allowed us to discriminate the long-term overall colony response, the that you have heard, from whooping signals that are uh, contributing to PC components with a rank that is a three or greater than three. So let me show you uh, the positive response of the bees when I only use PC component one and two. Here are the raw responses. This is the actual measurement. And here is the reconstructed measurements that I get when I only use PC score one and two. And I've got a phenomenal signal to noise ratio. And I've got a wonderful ability to actually quantitate the overall response of the colony without accounting for the very short whooping signals that are in this data as well. 
And then if I use a PC scores of rank three and greater, then I can isolate the contribution of the whooping signals. So from the raw data, I've got a splendid discrimination of the overall colony response and the whooping signals, which are seen to all take place in the first two seconds after the pulse. After two seconds, there are no more whooping signal, but there is also still a long living uh, uh, positive response of the buzzing. So how do I know that it's whooping and non-whooping? Well, I've actually carefully checked it. On the top graph, you can see the envelope of the vibration of uh, specific measurements that provide a strong response. This is the vibration before the pulse, this is the pulse, and this is the bee's reaction following the pulse. And you can hear and you can enjoy the envelope on the top graph. And on the bottom graph, the orange curve is the uh, overall colony's reaction assessed by the machine learning. And you see a beautiful, smooth graph, which is always uh, having a similar shape, very reliable shape, and which is reflecting the overall colony response. Was the blue curve that has got PC component up to 15, they also include the whooping signals. And by a critical listening of the waveform, if I was uh, shutting up for a second, then you would be able to appreciate that uh, the blue curve is actually com reflecting individual bees in the close vicinity of the accelerometer. And we want to ignore them, we want to dismiss them, because there are a few bees in the vicinity of the accelerometer. So here is uh, how the positive response looks like over a year of data. This is the first pilot study we did a couple of years ago. It starts in August, it finishes in August, the winter time is here. Uh, the uh, middle graph is the one uh, showing the positive response of the bees. You see boring, nothing happening in the summer, nothing happening in the summer. You, need a, you see a huge response in the winter. And you also see that uh, in the middle of the day, the response tends to be weaker. It is the strongest in early in the morning, and it is strongest at night time. The top graph, very briefly, is showing you the magnitude of the vibration that we managed to drive into the bees, even though we drive the very same vibration outside the box. Unfortunately, not the same vibration reaches the bees every time, which is a disappointment, which is a surprise. Not only does the vibration uh, magnitude change over the season, it also changes within one day, strongly suggesting that the presence of the bees on the honeycomb is actually affecting our ability to drive the vibration. But fear not the quality of the result, please, because you can see that even in instances here in mid-December, where the vibration that we managed to drive is extremely weak, we still have a huge response from the bees. And in instances in October, where the vibration is very strong, you see no response from the bees at all. So even though I am sorry about the variations that you see on the top graph, trust me, this is a meaningful graph. We have reached the threshold required to stimulate the bees, as demonstrated in this lack of strength here in December, as demonstrated by this strong vibrational pulse here in October, providing nothing. So. I would uh, trust by all means the middle graph that you can see. This is the first ever uh, reflex arc of the honeybee measured over more than a year on a pilot study. And then uh, we uh, ex exploited this technique over eight colonies in the United Kingdom belonging to the Be Good EU uh, funded uh, project. We uh, did it also in Belgium. We did it also in Portugal, but I'm only going to show you the data in the UK. Uh, so these bees are now uh, outdoors, there's eight of them, and thanks to the Be Good project, they are now also carefully inspected manually every three weeks. So not only did we undertake this experiment over eight colonies, but in addition to that, thanks to the Be Good project, we had phenomenal a careful inspection of the colony status every three weeks over the time duration of our measurement. And so we, of the eight colonies that we monitored, one underwent severe health deterioration. And we have very careful logs of this colony becoming queenless, 
uh, us trying to requeen her. The requeening works for two weeks and then the queen uh, disappeared again and this colony deteriorated until failure in September. So we have eight colonies, seven of them uh, were healthy or one of them became queenless and uh, remained uh, queenless in spite of efforts for the summer. So a scientist's dream would be to see the positive response being different for the hive that was queenless, and a scientist, scientist's dream would be to see the seven other colonies to have a similar response, but different from the one of colony three. So that's a dream that never happens in science, except for today. Today it will happen. So here is colony one, two, where well, these seven here are healthy. Colony three is the one that became queenless and we sustained the measurement all over the summer. And I cannot believe my eyes, this only happened in my dreams until today, but the one and only colony that became queenless and that was unhealthy is the one and only colony that has a huge positive response in the summer. Whilst in the summer, as I've already warned you before, the experiment is boring on any healthy colony. And uh, upon replacing it on September the 21st, we replaced this queenless colony with a healthy colony. And on September the 21st, suddenly the positive response disappears. So uh, here is uh, the magnitude of the vibration driven into the eight colonies across the summer. This is May, June, July, August, September. And the blue curve, the blue curve is the magnitude of the vibration averaged every day, driven in colony number three, the one that is uh, queenless. So the magnitude of the vibration that we drove into the queenless colony is not particularly high and it's not particularly low. So the vibration that they received is average. And yet the positive response of the bees, so this is the positive response of eight colonies averaged over one day. And the one that is uh, queenless has a substantially stronger reaction that you can easily discriminate from the other seven other colonies. So something uh, I've never seen in my life as a scientist, this is the absolute ideal experiment. What we were hoping to see is uh, actually seen in front of your eyes. So to cut a long story short, in the summertime, if you knock on your bees, I hope you won't hear a reaction, otherwise you should worry. And in the wintertime, if you knock on your bees and you hear something, that's absolutely normal. My uh, collaborators are in yellow. I thank them infinitely for helping me with this uh, study. And the floor is open to questions. Should I have the time, enough time to take questions? I don't know how I did with my time. There is time for questions. So thank you, everybody. Questions? Um, very interesting and, and indeed uh, great work to see that that you indeed discovered this uh, yeah this 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 really interesting phenomenon. Um, the the fact that um, the the red lines that you showed the the stimulus um, in one of the first stimulus charge where it was unfiltered, it it seemed that in summer the stimulus was a little bit less heavy or perceived less heavy maybe. Um, yeah, one, one. thank you for the, for the remark. So in the summertime, you see a very faint, uh, you're absolutely right, Pim. Pim is absolutely spot on. He's got the eyes of a scientist and uh, he has spotted that uh, the little reaction that we occasionally get in the summer, early in the morning here and here, there's a substance, it's a genuine phenomenon. It's not noise. You can see it because it's, there's a trend to it. You can see that this mild reaction is weaker than the huge one that you get in the winter. So you are absolutely spot on, Pim. And I forgot to uh, remark that uh, the lack of signal, the bee immobilization that we've discovered, we have actually demonstrated it experimentally. With regards to the positive response of the bees, what you can see is a phenomenological assessment of that response. We have no mechanistic explanation for that response. We have just uh, discovered it and we are just eluding the features of this signal. We do not know 
the physiological aspect that this response is revealing. And uh, you've spotted an interesting uh, phenomenological feature. In the summer, the weak responses that we occasionally get in the morning are weaker than in the winter. You're absolutely spot on, Pim. I don't know why and how. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Pim. A silly question, in fact, but I, but I, I saw on the top of your slides it says how the bees can detect it with a eight legs. Yes. <laughs> so I thought that you put that on purpose there. <laughs> uh, that's my son. Yeah, it's my son. He's passionate about spiders. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Dirk, you can fire me. I am fired. This is what happens when a physicist becomes interested in bees. <laughs> you end up with bees with eight legs. <laughs> I won't have dinner next to you tonight. <laughs> I'm offended. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, there are two two very interesting things. One is what really all these sounds mean to them, which we don't really know yet. Uh, and if they do respond similarly, not only, for example, like the one, the, the colony that it was uh, de queen, that she, did, she lost the queen, but also when we introduce the queen or when you start feeding or when you um, uh, when you treat them, yeah, different for varroa for different ways or whatever. So that's that's the two things that I would really really very interested to know if you yeah. Any idea. So uh, uh, you are suggesting uh, lots of interesting experiments to see the effect on the positive response. I am delighted to say that Luke Chamberlain in this room is my new PhD student on the job for you. <laughs> for the next four years, Luke can uh, explore these uh, fascinating questions. We've only just demonstrated the phenomenon. In fact, we didn't demonstrate it. This is done uh, for thousands of years by beekeeper. What we have done is to quantitate and carefully look into the response of the bees. But knocking on your bees, listening to them is something that's been done for as long as uh, bees have been kept on the planet Earth. So thank you for the question. Do we have time for one more? Yeah. Uh, I think it's really cool that you managed to discriminate uh, those signals. Um, and I'm wondering, could you say two words on the difference between the accelerometer and uh, the use of a microphone as it is used in the, uh, in the beep system? Is it only the location or is it the, the frequencies it picks up as in? Fantastic what? question. Thank you so much. So um, there is a very weak uh, lack of signal, which we attribute to the immobilization of the bees. Even with an accelerometer, this uh, signal is weak. And uh, even by critical listening, you will not perceive it. So if I play you these tracks uh, with the high quality headphones, you will not be able to perceive this drop of signal, even though you can see it here. So in my opinion, the immobilization feature of this new experiment cannot be undertaken with a microphone, in my opinion, but uh, it's worth a go. The stronger positive response that you get, you can hear it with the accelerometers, you can hear it with your own built-in ears in your brain, so put your, uh, hear, uh, your ear against the hive, you will hear zzz when you, you when you hit them. So that strong positive response uh, which is uh, the exciting one so far for the uh, the queenless colony, that could be well measured with a microphone. So in my opinion, the technique is uh, applicable to being received. The motor reaction of the bees can be indeed recorded with a microphone. And the beep system uh, could do it, provided that we consistently place the microphone somewhere in all hives. And the beep system can do it, provided that the beep system 
can uh, record for me the raw sound for three seconds every hour. Not a challenging technical uh, feature, so uh, I, I think uh, it should be uh, doable. And there was one more thing I wanted to say. Is it going to spring to my mind or not? The microphone, the positive. I can't remember now. So thank you so much for the question. Have I answered you? Yeah. Yeah, one moment. Zhao Dong. Thank you, Martin. So it's nice presentation, as you always have. Thank you. My question is, I mean, could this uh, introduce any stress to the uh, colony? I mean, for example, if I pet Nuno once every hour, he will be very annoyed by me. Yes, fantastic question. <laughs> Am I annoying the bees like Zhao Dong would annoy Capella if he knocked him every hour? <laughs> So when I came to choose uh, this signal, it took me half a day to choose this signal. I uh, sent, first of all, a knock. So in the electromagnetic shaker, originally, I sent a, a, a zero voltage followed by a step change to one and kept constant. So uh, literally a voltage knock. Absolutely nothing could be detected because the electromagnetic shaker is incapable of providing a knock. Then I had the idea of a sinusoidal wave, nothing happened. And then I increased the frequency of this wave until something just about happened. So the pulse that uh, you see here is uh, the one I've chosen because it was just about causing a mild reaction in the bees. So first of all, to answer the excellent question, I must highlight that the, all the results you have seen so far are using a pulse that just about annoys the bees or makes them to react. Secondly, a true honeybee hive, a true, forgive me, a wild honeybee hive would be in a tree, in a tree trunk, in a tree branch. That tree would be perhaps in a woodland. There might be wind and the branches might collide with each other. These would provide a vibrational shock wave much, much greater than what we have using. Thirdly, I have applied uh, the pulse uh, approximately every hour. And uh, the time course of the signal, as uh, demonstrated by the PCA scores and as demonstrated by the, the row uh, waveforms, the time course of the positive response is typically three to four seconds. So you get a bee's reaction for perhaps three seconds, perhaps four. So it is hard to believe that uh, with a signal that takes four seconds to decay, it's hard to believe that you wait an hour, then you repeat the measurement, they're annoyed for another four seconds. It's hard to believe that you have disturbed the colonies uh, substantially. But I think the, I think the, uh, the uh, another corroborative evidence is perhaps a temperature measurement. So in the winter time, you don't want to annoy your bees. And with a temperature probe, we could monitor whether the bees' uh, physiological status has really been upset or not. And I strongly suspect I will do it. I strongly suspect that uh, you won't see any temperature change whatsoever in the colony following uh, the pulse. I see my boss is uh, standing up. Is it time, boss? Time for me to it's, stop? It's time to stop. Oh, thank yes. you, thank you for thank all your you. questions. Yeah, I'm sorry, but there's an online question. There's an online question. So there is one, an, one, one, one online question, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have an online question through the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, Mia Finsgar, do you want to ask your question yourself, please? Can you unmute your microphone? Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, um, Professor Benchik. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very interesting presentation. My question would be, um, does the varying composition, contamination, adulteration of wax foundations influence the vibrations? and also the communication within the bee colony. Do we have any research about that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I answer that or do you want me to do it afterwards, Dirk? Uh, you are, can answer that question now. Yes. Thank you. So um, the honeycomb status will affect uh, the vibration with the accelerometer. It is one drawback or advantage, as you like, of the accelerometer measurement. The uh, heavier the density of the honeycomb, the weaker the vibration you detect. There is a superb poster by Sumit Bajare this afternoon in uh, this uh, conference to demonstrate, uh, to demonstrate the phenomenon. 
However, all the measurements have shown, I forgot to say, the positive response that I've shown you is the difference between the buzzing after and the buzzing before the pulse. So I've shown you different uh, signals. But yes, uh, indeed, the status of the comb will affect my measurement. And this is where the microphone, for once, will beat me. You guys with microphones, you're going to beat me, because uh, the microphone measurement will not be affected by the honeycomb status. So fantastic question. Thank you so much. And yes, this measurement is somewhat affected by the, uh, the perhaps PIM that answers maybe the weaker signal in the summertime, maybe. And then the second part of your question is the communication within the bees colonies, is it affected by my pulse? So uh, my two answers is the trees uh, knocking each other in a, in, in a wood, in a wild colony suffering knocks, natural knocks. I don't think they would be bothered. They are random knocks and the bees would discriminate that this is a knock outside the colony. This is not someone communicating with me. But uh, it's an interesting point, because if we believe Martin Lindauer, then uh, the vibration provided by the queen is causing the immobilization of the bees because they are listening to vibration. So I would say, no, I wouldn't worry about it, because the bees, in my opinion, will easily spot the fool knocking on their hives. Oh, this is a man. This, is Ma this must be Martin knocking on my hive. This can't be one of my fellow bees talking to me. That's my subjective opinion. I think it's time to interrupt him. 